It might not seem like it walking around St. George's picturesque streets or tanning in any of the beautiful beaches in the country, but Grenada has had a tumultuous past full of violence. It also remains the only English-speaking island in the Caribbean to have been invaded by the United States. To see why, join me for this brief look at the history and politics of Grenada. Prior to the arrival of the Europeans, the island was inhabited mainly by the Caribs. They were migrants from the South American mainland who first established communities in Grenada around 1100. Expert navigators who raided their neighbors in large dugout canoes, they had previously driven out the more peaceful Arawaks from the island. Their society lacked any important chiefs, military organization, or hierarchical structure, and thus internal conflicts were common. Rather, they were ferocious and individualistic, traits that would shape their interactions with the Europeans. In 1498, Christopher Columbus became the first European to sight the island of Grenada during his third voyage to the New World. He did not land, however, and merely named it Concepcion, a moniker that was never used. Instead, Spanish sailors called the island Granada, presumably after the city in Andalusia that the Spanish had just reconquered from the Moors. Eventually, it took on the French version of the name, in large part because although the Spanish claimed it, they never tried to colonize it. Indeed, it was not until 1609 that English tobacco planters attempted to settle, but within a year, most would be killed by Caribs. It would take another 40 years for a permanent settlement to be established. This was under the leadership of Jacques Diel du Parquet, the governor of the nearby French colony of Martinique, who brought a contingent of 203 men and made a peace deal with the chief Cairoane when they quote unquote purchased the island from the Caribs for a few hatchets, some glass beads, and two bottles of brandy. Not all Caribs were pleased with the land deal, however, and skirmishes continued until the French troops chased the last of them to Satur Bay at the northern end of the island. Rather than submitting to the colonists, the remaining care of men, women, and children jumped to their deaths from the cliffs. French planters established crops that provided indigo, tobacco, coffee, cocoa, and sugar, and imported thousands of enslaved Africans to tend to the fields, which began to spread into the virgin forest of the interior and even cultivated on steep hillsides. They would set their capital at Fort Royal, a natural port on the southwest of the island, since renamed St. George's. Grenada began to flourish with the introduction of the crops, especially sugar. Its prosperity, however, was to make it a prize of war, and Britain recaptured the island during the Seven Years' War. As its plantation economy continued to grow, by the late 1760s it accounted for 50% of the British Caribbean cocoa exports. So did the struggle between the French and the British for control. Over the next two decades, the French got the best of them twice, including at the Battle of Grenada on July 6, 1779, when after a French fleet occupied the island, Lord Byron's grandfather, joined Byron, led a disastrous attempt to try to get it back. Despite the losses, the British were very interested in regaining the rich plantation island, especially because by that point it was also producing cotton, an integral ingredient in their economic boom. So in 1783, they forced the French to cede them the island under the Treaty of Paris. Animosity between the new British colonists and the remaining French settlers persisted after the treaty. In 1795, a group of French Catholics, encouraged by the French and Haitian revolutions and supported by comrades in Martinique, armed themselves for rebellion. Led by Julien Fedon, an African French planter from Grenada Central Mountains, they attacked the British at Granville, capturing and executing the British governor and other hostages. Fedon's guerrillas controlled much of the island for more than a year, but their dreams of a black republic would never come to pass, as they were unable to take St. George's and would eventually be overcome by the British Navy under the leadership of Ralph Overcrombie. Fedon was never captured. It's likely he escaped to Martinique or drowned attempting to get there, though it's sometimes said that he lived out his days hiding in Grenada's mountainous jungles. The islands enslaved would have to wait another 38 years for their emancipation, as it was in 1833 when the British Parliament passed the Slavery Abolition Act. That same year, Grenada became part of the British Windward Islands Administration. This was an administrative grouping that included most of the neighboring islands, including Tobago, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, the Grenadines, Dominica, and of course Barbados, which was the seat of government until 1885, after which it was moved to St. George's. The arrangement set up a system where the islands had a governor in common, but each island retained its own institutions. In 1859, a common court of appeal was set up, which consisted of the chief justices of each of the islands. During this period, 
In 1843, nutmeg was introduced to Grenada. It was a long time coming. Nutmeg is originally from the Banda Islands in Indonesia, and Europeans have tried to get their hands on it for centuries. First, the Portuguese and later the Dutch took control of the spice trade, the latter by literally fighting a war and enslaving the population of the Banda Islands. During the Napoleonic Wars, however, the British occupied the islands temporarily and took the opportunity to transplant some of the nutmeg trees to other British colonies. That is how nutmeg ended up in Grenada since, one, it just happened to have perfect soil to grow the trees, and two, it was so much closer to Britain. Since then, it has been an important part of the Grenadian economy, so much so that today the harvesting of the crop provides income to 30% of the population and the island is responsible for 20 to 30 percent of the world's total nutmeg production. That, along with the production of cocoa, explained Grenada's nickname, Spice Island. As time went on, Grenada's colonial status changed at a glacial pace. First, in 1877, the island became a crown colony. This meant that the old representative system where the planters held sway was discontinued and changed to one where the governor was much more powerful. This was not so much because the planters had been abusing their power, but rather that they showed little interest in public affairs and were mostly absent. Later, in 1922, as a result of the recommendations of the Woods Commission, the island was granted five elected members in the Legislative Council. This was largely the work of a single man, T.A. Mary Show. Mary Show was a prominent journalist who was a longtime advocate of representative government in a West Indian Federation he would become the most notable Grenadian politician of the early 20th century. Even these early minor concessions, however, were restricted by race. Voting was limited to those with minimum property ownership, which resulted in the exclusion of the majority black peasantry. The UK considered making constitutional changes in the 1940s, but they came to naught. Instead, it would take until 1951 for universal suffrage to come to the island. This time, the reason was social upheaval, as a result of the so-called Red Sky Days, so named for the way that plantations and buildings set aflame by workers had painted the sky. This was during a month-long general strike, the first in Grenada's history, and one where the British had to use military reinforcements to regain control of the situation. The man responsible for the labor mobilization was Eric Gehry, the force behind trade unionism in the island since 1949 when he returned to Grenada after being deported from Aruba for his attempts at organizing the workers there. He had founded the Grenada Manual and Mental Workers Union in 1950 and had had some success in gaining compensation for workers, but the strike widely surpassed those previous accomplishments. Wages were increased sometimes as much as 33.3% and provision was made for paid leave. Moreover, beyond the universal suffrage, there was also an expansion in the number of elected members in the Legislative Council. Not surprisingly then, Gary used his newfound fame and popularity to found a new political organization, the Grenada United Labor Party, or GALP, which would go on to win every election for the next decade and propel Gary as the main politician in the following decades. Not that there wasn't competition. There was Herbert Blaise, who founded the Grenada National Party, or GNP, and managed to dislodge Gary from his chief minister position in 1961. This success had a lot to do with the party support of a political union with Trinidad. As it happens, from 1958 to 1962, Grenada, along with most of the other British colonies of the Caribbean, including Jamaica, considered creating some type of unified federal state squabbles over what exactly this would look like, and concern from Jamaicans about subsidizing the smaller islands, however, led to Jamaica's exit from the venture. This left the potential to center the project around Trinidad, but Eric Williams, the Trinidadian leader, decided to say no to a federation without Jamaica, with his famous phrase, one from ten leaves not. This setback, coupled with the GMP's inability to deal with the working class demands, paved the way for Eric Gary's return. Gary would go on to be the leader of the island until 1979, first under a new relationship with Britain as a free associated state between 1967 and 1974, and later as an independent Grenada's first prime minister. The other opposition that developed during this time was the New Jewel Movement, or NJM. This was a group that advocated what it called participatory democracy and was rooted in the black power movement that had shook the Caribbean in the early 70s. It was led by Maurice Bishop, a lawyer educated in Britain, and other similarly educated intellectuals who saw Garyism as the exact wrong path for the island. Independence for Grenada officially came on February 7, 1974. 
It, however, was not the panacea or even joyful occasion you might think. Instead, the transition was marked by violence, strikes, and controversy centering around Gary. This was especially so because of sharp economic decline and the massive inequality that persisted in the island. Unemployment in 1970, for example, stood around 75%. Gary's extravagance didn't help, nor did the corruption scandal popularly referred to as Quandermania, which emptied the nation's coffers. Furthermore, his crackdown on the black power movement that was sweeping the Caribbean had undermined his credentials as a leader who defended the black masses, as did his acceptance of a knighthood from the Queen. The more concerning issue, however, was Gary's heavy-handed tactics against his opposition, which made some people worry that Gary might install himself as a dictator. In 1970, he formed a private army called the Mongoose Gang, which he used to beat his opponents. One of the more notorious incidents, known as Bloody Sunday, occurred on November 18, 1973, when the gang badly beat Maurice Bishop and two other members of the NJM. Bishop suffered a broken jaw in the attack and was hospitalized for several weeks. In response, a committee of 22 was established by the trade unions, civic organizations and the church, which then organized a strike on January 1, 1974 and a protest march on January 21st. The latter one turned especially violent as the marchers were attacked by police. Known as Bloody Monday, several people were injured and Rupert Bishop, the father of Maurice Bishop, the leader of the New Jewel movement, was killed. By Independence Day itself, February 7, 1974, the NJM's entire leadership was imprisoned. Gary still won the next election in 1976, but the NJM, along with other opposition parties, managed to reduce Gulp's majority. In 1977, as Gary began receiving advice from General Augusto Pinochet of Chile on how to deal with civil unrest and his police and military also received counterinsurgency training from that regime, the NJM retaliated by developing links with Fidel Castro and his Marxist government in Cuba. Something had to give. And it did. On March 1979, while Gary was out of the country, the NJM staged a bloodless coup proclaimed a People's Revolutionary Government, or PRG, and named their leader Maurice Bishop as Prime Minister. The new government faced opposition from Western nations because of its socialist principles and the substantial aid it had begun receiving from Cuba. There has been a major campaign over the last several weeks and months with some remarks by the Vice President in Miami and then the President himself. And in all of these remarks and allegations, different allegations were made against our country. But it embarked in a program to rebuild the economy which had been left in this array by Gary. Widely popular, although justly criticized for its suppression of political dissent, the revolution ended in October 1983 after a split developed in the leadership of the party. The majority of it voted for joint leadership by Prime Minister Maurice Bishop and Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Bernard Cord. But when Bishop refused to abide by the decision, he was placed under house arrest on October 13, 1983. Six days later, on the 19th, he was freed by a crowd of civilian supporters. Bishop then led them to Fort Rupert, the military headquarters where he had access to the armory. Two army personnel were then shot by a known assailant and a struggle followed for control of the fort. Bishop and seven of his closest comrades were disarmed and then shot dead by members of the People's Revolutionary Army. Others were killed or wounded in the crossfire or as they attempted to escape the fort. A revolutionary military council took over and placed the island under curfew. In response, less than a week later, on October 25th, the United States, supported by right-wing governments in the Caribbean, launched Operation Urgent Fury. Despite widespread international condemnation and a UN vote that called it a quote-unquote flagrant violation of international law, it took the U.S. four days to overwhelm the defenders and install an interim government, which ended any potential chance of a regrouping of surviving popular revolutionary forces. In 2000, a Grenada Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established to deal with some of the controversies of the 1970s and 1980s. It attempted to find Bishop's body, but it failed. Its report was completed in 2006. Those convicted of plotting to kill Maurice Bishop and his comrades came to be known as the Grenada 17. The last of them was released from prison in 2009. Since then, politics has been dominated by two major parties. They are the New National Party and the National Democratic Congress. 
The former is a conservative party, the result of a union between Blaze's National Party and other right-wing parties after the U.S. invasion. And the latter is a center-left party, which was founded in opposition to the NNP by George Brisson, an erstwhile member of the NJM. Between the two of them, they account for all prime ministers since the U.S. invasion, four for the NNP and three for the NDC, with the NNP currently in power under the leadership of Keith Mitchell. Meanwhile, the economy has shifted from agriculture to services, especially tourism. Today, it accounts for 55.8% of overall GDP, while agriculture accounts for less than 5% of GDP. Although GDP per capita has steadily improved since the U.S. invasion, inequality remains a problem. The main issue is that its dependence on tourism leaves it very vulnerable to global currents. COVID has been devastating for the island, but a far more immediate concern for the future are hurricanes. The last two major ones, Ivan and Emily in 2004 and 2005 respectively, were devastating for the island. Especially Ivan, which reached Category 5 status and damaged at least 89% of the small island, or 28 of 31,000 homes, as well as its two major hospitals. As hurricanes multiply because of climate change, Grenada will have to invest in resilient infrastructure in a sustainable economic model. Today, it seems like Grenada has put political violence behind it. Dependency, on the other hand, is a much harder problem to tackle.